morning everyone. How many of you have got one of these? iPad. I'm not, I don't necessarily mean an iPad, I mean a smart tablet. And what about a, a smartphone? This is in the Telegraph today. Humans have a shorter attention span than goldfish thanks to smartphones. What's poignant about this, if you look at this online, there is a wonderful photograph of a guy sitting on a beautiful blue water boat and he's got a smartphone in his hand and there's a right whale going right past his boat and he hasn't seen it. Have a look at that, it's a fantastic photograph. The point of that is, is that don't miss the obvious. You've had some wonderful people here telling you about various things and there is a terrible tendency I think in one's life to focus on something and miss the bigger picture. So who am I? I'm the new business manager at Burfon. And watch this, I am taking my hat off and I'm putting it down there. I'm now going to talk to you as a person who had the same dilemmas as you did. I had a dream. My wife had a dream. It wasn't quite as noble, perhaps, as Martin Luther King, but we wanted to go off to the deep blue. And we had to make all the wonderful decisions that you're having. I am so envious of you. You are on the cusp of this fantastic adventure and you've come right to the right place to start it. You've come to the World Cruising Club. They are the experts to help you. You've come to a very good yard. They're here to help you. And they helped me. I wasn't part of the Burton thing when I actually came to do this. And there was the boat I found. She was a bit bigger than I thought. She's a 53 foot yacht and she was in pretty bad condition. And the owner, he hadn't really sailed offshore. He was a coastal sailor, and he sailed it around the coast of Norway, Denmark, that sort of area. And you can see she's a naiad, in fact. She's not red, she's blue. I decided to change the color. And she was an ideal yacht for this sort of thing, but she needed a lot of work doing. And I'll tell you the price. I paid 160,000 euros for that boat, and I spent probably 110,000 pounds refitting her. So that gives you an idea of the scale of what I had to envisage. Don't be put off by that, it can be done. And I'm going to take you back a little bit, where it starts. This is a broker. <laughs> there wasn't any reaction, I'm going to say it again, and I want the reaction. <laughs> Boo, hiss, This is a Burthen broker. <laughs> this brings me back to that photograph of the whale going by. Don't miss the obvious. We can all go online and have a good look around. You think you know what you want and everything else. These guys are dedicated. They wouldn't be doing that job unless they were interested. It's a very specialized job. And Alan, Mark at the back there, he has the dream. He wants to go and do this. So there it is in front of you. It starts with that. And what's this to do with refit? They will show you a boat that is a good boat. You may decide you want to buy a new boat and not have all these things, but it's a great fun thing to do, and it's a budget thing, this is the place to start, with an experienced broker who will show you. Behind that, you would have heard Brian talking about vertical integration. This is a wonderful place, because it's got a marina, it's got a brokerage, they've got this wonderful shipyard, you can do the whole thing here. And I had to, I was still working, I had to leave it in the care of people I trusted, and people like Ian Stables, who's been here for a very long time, or a chap called Robin Village, some of you may have even met him. He's a great guy. He's one of the many project managers here who looks after all the boats when they're doing refits. What's happened there? We even have the beauty. Before you get cross with me, this is Heather Morton, who can make your boat look beautiful. She's an expert in paint. She's got a, a situation where she worked for many years for Axo Nobel and developed paints like All Group and all the rest of it. So if the budget's there, you can make your boat look beautiful as well. So planning ahead. If you're buying a boat, and it's obvious because you're here, make sure that the broker, the surveyor, the boatyard, you're not just cruising the Solent, you're off to the Blue Water Cruising. And there are a number of differences, as we all know. And they've touched on them in all these lectures, and we're going to go through them in bit, perhaps in a bit more detail. Starting from the bottom, we had a very, very good advice yesterday. Keep it simple. Keep the water out, stay on the boat, and so on. And the tenets of that come from the refit. When you go onto the refit, you're looking initially at the bottom, and the broker, the surveyor, your experience, if you have any, will help you look at these various areas. And it starts with even the propeller. Unusually on my boat, I have two engines. Very unusual for a boat her side. 
You see this particular one there? Can you see this? No, go back. Can you see that little, oh, I can't do that. I'm going to use this one. Anyone know what sort of propeller that is? It's a folding propeller. And in fact, there are many of these around. They're called a max prop. Now, my boat originally had these types of propellers. And they do create a bit of drag. You can see that on a sort of traditional boat, if you like. I wouldn't worry about it being a traditional one. Uh, you, everyone will talk about drag on a boat. It isn't actually as much as they say. But on two propellers, it was probably quite a lot. So I, in fact, went and bought second-hand max props, which actually fold and go in line with the water, so there's not as much drag. You can see here on a racing-type boat, they have this type of sail drive. That is obviously very efficient. It works very well. The only thing I'd say about that, I had two boats in the Caribbean that I used to look after. One had this type of prop, and the other had a conventional one. In racing, this boat would win. In a motoring uh, situation, this boat would win. So it's all up to your choice. Propellers will look like that very quickly, I'm afraid. And in fact, people have always asked me, is it worth anti-fouling a prop? Is it worth putting on these uh, various things to stop the barnacles? In reality, it doesn't work, I'm afraid. It's very hard to keep a propeller clean, and therefore you have to go down and dive below. So looking at your propeller is the first part of the actual um, process that you need to do. Where does the prop attach to? This is one of the most important parts of a boat when you're looking at a refit, I think. You've got to actually have a good close look at this particular area here where the shaft actually comes through, through the stern gland. And there are lots of different types. This is a typical Volvo one. This here, if I was having a survey done in a refit, that's something I'd look at really carefully. It's not in good condition. This is a potential sinking area of the boat. You have to spend a lot of time looking at a thing like that. And if I were you at the refit stage, have a very, very good look at what you've got there. You may be lucky enough to have a bow thruster. Not everybody's cup of tea. There was one on my boat already. So I had to look at that very carefully to make sure it was all working order. It is a potential sink area as well. It's a brilliant bit of kit, to be honest. My boat has a lot of windage forward, and having that particular apparatus there was great. And in fact, I used it mostly for anchoring, funny enough. When we we're going backwards, we used to use the bow thruster to keep the boat in line, because as it drifted sideways, it would pull the anchor out. Steering. We've talked about steering and rudders. Uh, Alan was pointing out the difference between the various rudders. Here is a rudder that's actually attached in one place, modern type rudder. You need to have this looked at really carefully, and if there are any issues, you have to do this part of the refit. I, in fact, took my rudder off. It's a different rudder to this one. It has a bearing further down here, and we looked at the steering really carefully. I was advised by the yard that this area here was in poor condition. We took this off, the quadrant, we rebuilt it, repainted it, we put on new cables, and we ended up looking at the whole steering system because it's so vital. That is a key part if you've got a wheel boat. You may have a tiller boat, it's a slightly simpler system. But if you look at the various rudders that are available, this is what Alan was talking about, a rudder that's got a slightly counterbalanced area here. This is a sort of more traditional shape, and you can see you've got a bearing area there which needs to be looked at carefully. There's the bearing at the top that goes through the hull. Here is the normal spade rudder, that's a bearing there, and it's a potential sinking point. So if that falls off, it's a very difficult situation at sea. So if you do your work at the refit, that's the very strong area that I suggest you look at. Here's a rudder that's transom hung. Do you think that's safe to go off on a big ocean cruise? Do we? It is. It's definitely safe. And in many ways, it's quite interesting, because a lot of the offshore racing yachts have these. There's a thing called a mocha, it goes round the world, round Cape Horn. They have rudders that hang on the back like that. And in many ways, you can see what's going wrong. If it's going to fall off, you've got this visual. Here, you won't see it. So in many ways, that's a slightly safer rudder, funnily enough. It's probably not as robust and as strong, but they're certainly good enough to go across the Atlantic. So don't be by that. It's an actually a very good design, and, and you can cross Atlantics with it. And this one here, you can see it's got twin rudders. So if you lose one, you've got the other. And it does work well with one rudder, surprisingly. Anodes. Look at the anodes very carefully when you're at a refit. Uh, in the old days when you went to the Caribbean, very difficult to get hold of certain anodes. All of that's changed. There are many good chandleries now in the Caribbean and you can actually get virtually every anode. When I arrived in the Caribbean, one anode was like that and one anode was like that. I have two. And it was clear that the engine was not bonding correctly on the port side. 
And so what I'd say is, is that this is an incredibly important part of your refit. Make sure all the anodes, you know where they are. Make sure you carry some spares. You will find places don't have the one you want. There are many different anodes on a the boat. There are anodes on engines. There are anodes underneath the boat. There are anodes on your bow thrusters. There are anodes even on fridges. You have to look and find all these and make sure you've got your spares when you go off. And that's an important part of the refit when you're looking at that. This is probably the most important. Your skin fittings. On my boat in Darba, I have 27. Stunning, 27. And I only found those because I was involved in the refit. If you buy a brand new boat, there's every chance you won't know where they all are. And my ones were very much in that condition. She was an old boat. You can see there was a little crack there. That's one that came off. And when you got inside it, it was all corroded. This is a terrible sinking point. And these positions can be very difficult to see and very difficult to find. And so be aware of where all your skin fittings are. When you're at your refit stage, this is where you're looking. You're looking at these skin fittings, one by one. Some are very complicated. You can see this is a sort of strum box. Lots of different fittings there going through the hull and up to various places. They all need to be checked to see they're integrally tight. This is the old adage, keep the water out. And you do that at the refit stage. Go through the yacht where you can. You may not have the time to do this all on your own. You may need to require other people to do this for you. So make sure that you trust them and they are the right people doing it. Critical part of the boat. Plastic ones. Are they safe? Would you have a plastic fitting? Yes. Yes, they are. They're fine. If anything, I think I've had them on various boats I've owned. They get a little bit brittle as they get older. And you may kick one and crack it, but that's very unlikely. A lot of them look like this. They look like they need maintenance. And here's a brand new one. Lovely fitted one, made of bronze. I love fittings like that. They're big and easy to move. You notice there, there's a little um, label. It's a very good idea to label all your fittings, not only with what it is, but also the, the, the size, the actual size of the pipe. On my boat, I've got metric, I've got imperial. It's lovely to know exactly what pipe you're fitting onto that, because if the pipe is degraded and you're replacing it, you go off to the thing thinking you're buying the right pipe, you come back to the boat, oh my word, it's a different size. And the guy I saw, he had a very simple solution. He went off to the hardware store and he got lots of little labels, key labels. And he wrote on the key labels, which he clipped together, fairly waterproof. And he could see exactly what that was and what size it was. Very useful thing to do at the refit stage. The underneath. When you leave, you will need anti-fouling. And it's a big debate as to what you have and what you do and what colour it is. Here's a boat that's white. Looks lovely. Here's in Darba to prove that I did bring it to the berthel. It's there. Had the anti-fouling done. I prefer black. The only reason I prefer black is because it suits the colour of the boat. And also, when it gets dirty and there's a line, you don't see it as much. On a white yacht, as soon as it heals, you can actually see if it's clean or not. And this one, although it doesn't show it very well, is a thing called copper coat. Some people swear by copper coat, some people don't. It's, I can't give you advice on that. I have a very good friend who had a, an oyster, went off long distance, and his copper coat was very good and it worked very well for him. But I can also tell you, we do work for the RNLI here. They've tested it, tried it, they've rejected it. Now, they've got very different boats as well, don't forget. So, there's no real answer to that, and I'm not advising you, but some people do like it with the theory that you will never have to re actually re-varnish or, re or rather re-antifile for another 10 years, I think is what they try to say. In the Caribbean, you will find very poisonous paints. They are, in fact, not very regulatory out there, and they have this very high tin content. You can buy it in Trinidad, Island 44 it's called, and it's very poisonous. If you try to go to New Zealand with that, they'll test it and they'll make you take it off. We do have an ecological responsibility because it is an area of the boat that is very poisonous and you will get great advice from somebody like Heather. Tell her what you're doing, where you're going. She's a paint expert, don't forget, and she'll say, have this one, or if you're not going to sail quite as far, you're going to stay in certain waters, she'll offer another one because there are various types. Take advice on that. Do it at the refit stage and keep it the same. Keels. There are lots of different keels. You're still looking at the outside boat. Here's a twin bilge keel. Safe to go offshore? Yes, it is. It is. It's probably some people have preferences. This is a well-designed boat. Uh, there were many westerlies that were built like this in the early days. They're all capable of crossing oceans and all the rest of it. 
The thin keels are more like this, or you've got this style, or a traditional style. And it's held on with these bolts. And there's been a lot of debate about this, as we know, by that very unfortunate accident that took so much press attention and media attention. As the person said to you before, it's a very, very rare occurrence. And the keel loss that did happen was a series of circumstances that led to it. Like an aircraft crash is not one thing, many things add to the whole thing. Losing a keel is a very, very rare thing. But at your refit stage, it's upon you to look at that area. Some are very easy. You've got this one here. This is the sort of matrix that you might have even read about in that incident, where you look at where the actual keel bolts are attached, what the whole thing, how the whole thing's held. And if in any doubt, it's easy to drop that off and have a quick look. Here's a keel that's in wonderful condition. You can see the bolts are really good. And it's probably come off a thing a bit like this. And I would say to you that this is a really important place to look if you're buying a boat that's second hand and you're doing your sort of major part of it. On my boat, it was terribly difficult to do. I had to take a whole fuel tank out because the keel bolts were underneath it. And I didn't do it, to be honest. I didn't do it till I came back to this country. And when I tightened them up, they were really quite slack. So it is an area I suggest that you do. After 50,000 miles, is not the time to look at it. Do it at the beginning if you can. And on a lot of boats, as I say, it's very easy to find that area. So starting from the bottom, stern gear we had, stern glands, bow thruster, rudder steering mirrors, anodes, seacocks. That's just the outside. <laughs> Don't be put off. It's great fun doing this. If you are enthusiastic, if you can't do it yourself, and I'm a bodger, I can't do a lot of tasks on a boat. I was in the position where I was lucky enough to get someone else to do it. Equipment inside the boat. Here's the thing, the engine. There was a lovely man that used to race with us years ago called Jean-Louis Fabry. He used to drive into cows under sail, and he'd go right into the marina under mainsail, reverse the main, and back into the berth. He was disdainful of engines. Isn't that necessary? He was a great sailor. In reality, when you're cruising, you need an engine. A, to move, but B, probably to charge on the smaller boats. And it is a vitally important part of the boat. This is my engine room. Um, you can just see the other engine there. Looks beautiful and clean, doesn't it? Polishy. That's 15, 20 years old, that engine. Behind it was my bit noir, the generator. And I was advised to have a compression test on these engines, and I did. And the back cylinder on both engines was actually quite low. And they said to me, you really should take these engines out, put in a new piston on the back. I haven't. To this day, I haven't. It smokes a bit when it starts. It soon tightens up, and off it goes. Now, in reality, if I'd had the time and the budget, I probably would have changed the engines, but it would have been really expensive. Two engines, don't forget. But I decided not to. Behind that was a lovely generator called a Westerbeek, and it's a common generator, and uh, it was fitted to a lot of Scandinavian boats at that time. And they said to me, change it. And I went, nah, can't afford it, no time, and I left it. And it worked, it was fine. It was running perfectly well. So off we went, and I've done that again. Here are some alternatives. I did take a spare, a Honda, uh, in fact a two kilowatt one. Here's a lovely generator. Many boats have these. It's called a, yes, exactly right. One of the greatest generators ever designed. Wonderfully compact, very quiet, wonderful sound cover. My one's really noisy, because it's got no cover. This one you can hardly hear. And it's brilliant engineering. And there's bigger boats will go to things like Northern Lights. So this I think is actually a Northern Lights or an Onan. And this was the one I was offered. Put it in your boat, don't have the pain. Venezuela, two years later. There's the engine room. I was miles from anywhere. This tiny little exhaust here developed a pinprick and it squirted salt water all over the back of the generator. And I didn't know it was happening. I couldn't see it. And eventually the whole thing failed. So I was stuck miles from anywhere without support. And so I managed to find a little Venezuelan guy, hardly spoke any English, and he helped us remove it. And it was a big task, you can see, we had to lift it out the engine room, over these engines, and into the cabin floor where we were gonna work on it. Now what does a skipper do in that situation? Well, what he does is he repairs to the bar, and he has a beer, cast the iniquities of the world against him, and he puts the crew to sort it out. <laughs> Anne Louise is an absolute stalwart. I call her my Swiss army wife. <laughs> There we are working on the generator in the actual main saloon. And we took the generator off. Venezuela is an oil country. And they rewound it for me there. Because I spoke to Ron Westerbeek himself and said, shall I get another one? 12,000 pounds. 
shipping it, bringing it there. It was a nightmare. And I said, shall I rewind it in Venezuela? He said, don't do it. I thought, they're, a, they're an oil producing company, and they, uh, country rather, and they actually rewound it for me. The whole thing, in and out, cost me 1,200 US dollars. So it was a marvelous experience. I should have changed the generator, is the answer. The stress and strain of it all was just too much. So at your refit stage, if you can, follow the advice of the people that are telling you, because I thought I knew better, and we had this tremendous issue. Fuel. Fuel in Venezuela was terrible. We had to polish it all the time. And you'll find this improved enormously in the Caribbean and further places that you go to. But you do have the situation where you must, must filter your fuel. And make sure that any boat you have has pre-filters and post-filters. So you have one on the engine. I eventually put on these Raycor type. I like them because you could see here in this area, it's clear. Wonderful filters here. You can have the different types. And in the end, in my engine room, I have a, what's called a fuel polishing system where it goes through two pre-filters and into the main filter and then to the engine filter. Wonderful to have. Your engine will never die, because once an engine actually stops through dirt and so on, you, have a, you will find that you're, you're having huge problems. Pre-filter is one way. Power. Major part of the boat. We've already discussed batteries and everything. When you're doing your refit, you've got to see all the obvious ones, like strapping it down and everything. Good positioning. I have two of these, in fact. I've got a backup one, for, for reasons I'll explain in a minute. And I also have a, an inverter which is a great bit of kit, but unfortunately what it does do is it hammers the batteries. This one here has a rate of three and a half kilowatts, so I can actually run a kettle off that. Virtually everything on my boat I can run off that, bar the water maker. And the great thing you must have, I always think, is one of these, is a battery monitor. Fit a battery monitor if there isn't one on the yacht. This Link 10 is the one I've got, there are many types, created by Xantrex. You can see when a light goes on, so if there's nothing running on the circuit, it's zero. If somebody turns a light on the back of the boat, it immediately shows on this dial. So you know how much power you're using at any one time. Great to know. Wonderful bit to put in at the refit stage. Fire extinguishers. If you have a fire on board, it's a major issue if you're offshore. Make sure they're good. Replacing them is quite expensive. There are 10 on my yacht. Strange to think that, but it's quite a big yacht. It's 53 foot, so we've got them forward for the people forward. We've got them in various areas in the yacht. There's two in the main engine room, automatic ones like this. And make sure that they are, in fact, really in the right positions and everything else. Have those properly looked at at your survey stage. This might all add to the value of the boat that you're paying, the actual price you're paying for the boat, all the various things you have to do. The, the, I only mention diesel heaters, because so many European yachts have them fitted. I had one on my boat. I didn't use it for 10 years. I was 10 years in the Caribbean with this yacht, and I hardly used it. And of course, when I got back to England, it wouldn't work, and I had to rebuild it completely. So if you are in the Caribbean, do run your diesel heater in and again, because in fact, it'll just die on you. It's like all things on a boat. If it's not used, they deteriorate. Water. Water systems. Have that looked at really carefully. Most yachts these days have a pressure pump. These can be the bête noire. Why? Because when you're sailing along, if a pipe cracks or it falls off, these things fire up. Next thing you know, all your water's in the bilge. It happened to me. I carry nearly 1,800 litres of water. 1,800 litres of water went in the bilge. I had heart failure. I suddenly saw this water and I looked down. What's the first thing you do if you see water down there? Correct? What do we do? Touch it. Touch it. And? What is exactly. It took me 20 minutes of panic to realise it was in fact fresh water. So, one to remember. So that's why that is so important. We've got one of these on the boat, but it wasn't any good. So I replaced it. Because you may need to have a manual system. And we had a system on the boat, actually, where you were not allowed to have that electric pump on unless you were having a shower or something like that. We used to turn it off. Everyone filling a kettle did it from one of these. It preserves water, and it's also a wonderful backup if any of the electrics fail. If you're lucky enough to have a water maker, it's a great thing. You could be less worried about your uh, water usage on a major crossing. And at the refit stage, if you've got one of these, you really need to look at, make sure that they do work. They come in many different types, guises and sizes. You can get 12 volt ones, 24 volt ones. Uh, this is a lovely sea recovery one, quite sophisticated. Do you remember the KISS, keep it simple? My one's a very basic one, but it produces 120 litres an hour. And that's a lot of water for two people, so we're confident with the amount of water. And you can see, 
I'm very spoiled. We have a washing machine and tumble dryer. I sacrificed this cabin totally. I had four cabins and I sacrificed it for a workroom and a washroom. And that's where I put the water maker. And I love filters like this. You can't see it very well, but they are clear filters. So you can see through those filters when they need changing. So many of them are black and solid. You don't know what condition the filter's in. But I like this particular system because it's just one low pressure pump that pumps the water up to here. High pressure pump then pushes it through these membranes. And then the excess water goes over the side and the fresh water goes into the tank. Very simple system, very easy to use and very easy to change. As you can see, it's all accessible. Heads. Why are they called heads? Because your head's often buried in them, mending them, that's why. When you're at refit, take the opportunity to pull it all apart. Does that bolt need to come off? On my one, if you take that one off there, the head drops into the bilge and you can't get it back in, and it's just a nightmare. You don't need to take those ones off. If you're taking it apart, it's those ones there. Have you got the spanner that fits behind to do it? I didn't. I had to buy one. So it's all those simple issues. In fact, our heads are all electric. They've got macerators, great bits of kit if they're used properly. Uh, this is a very straightforward Jabsco. They work wonderfully well. I only put this in at refit because we're now moving into a situation in European legislation where many boats are expected to have holding tanks. Quite a lot of boats are not built with them. And it is an opportunity at refit to put one in. My boat has two holding tanks, Scandinavian built, that's why. And they're very small. They don't have to be big, but if you go into a marina eventually somewhere, even in places like, um, uh, I think in Mamaris and Turkey and all these places, they're really adamant and strong about this. And lots of boats don't fit them. They don't have to be big, you just have to qualify. So if you're at a refit stage, it's certainly one to consider. Not vital, but I would say with all the legislation changing, you might think about that. Fridges. <coughs> Terribly important to look at your fridges, obviously. I like this fridge. The reason I like this fridge is it's top loading. Why don't I like that fridge? It's a beautiful fridge. The reason is, as soon as you open it, you'll see in your wrong way around, everything comes out and it falls on top of you. So it's a marvelous fridge when you're standing upright, plus all the cold air drops out. These fridges, obviously, if you lift them up, they're easy to go in. It's separated nicely. As you can see here, there's a freezer this side and there's various levels. And look there, there's a door there. So you can access the fridge that way as well. So it's a lovely design. It's preference. What do you like? Some boats don't have very big fridges. I'm very lucky on my boat. We have lots of power, so we could have freezers and fridges. I was advised to change all my various compressors. This is an average frigger boat isotherm style with like a Freon gas in it that pressures up. That's what I've got. I was advised not to have them in the Caribbean and in, in, in ambient temperatures that are high. It works wonderfully. This is one you're afraid you can't see it very well. It's a very sophisticated fridge compressor. It has salt water running through it out as a cooling thing. And some of them actually send a cooling system down into the keel and they cool on the keel and then come back in. These are very sophisticated ones. But it is important. If you're living, we were talking about comfort and being on a boat. You do need refrigeration. And it's lovely to have cold drinks. It's lovely to have food that lasts a long time, especially if you're going three weeks across the Atlantic. Having your food fresh when you get the other side and still having things like we had ice creams towards the end of the crossing. And so it's great if you've got that, and it's wonderful to have. If you're lucky enough to have air conditioning, it requires a lot of power. You've got to have pretty big generators and so on to run these sorts of bits of kit. You also have to be plugged in at shore. We didn't have it fitted. It's a big boat, it merited it, but because it had so many hatches and it had so many areas that opened up, particularly the side portholes, we decided to go without and we survive perfectly well without. But it's a wonderful addition if you do feel the heat. Bilge pumps. When you're doing your refit, make sure if water does come in the boat, you can pump it out. There's the old adage, there's no bilge pump greater than a frightened man with a bucket. And that's true. You can throw a lot of water out with a bucket. But having electric ones like this, I had a big bilge pump system I could set up to go anywhere in the boat. You see this lady here, she's got one. Wonderful bit of kit, big long, she could pump for hours like that without getting tired. And she could put these pipes anywhere and pump out the place. I made one like that and it didn't work. I tried it thinking, and I hadn't used it, and I tried it and it genuinely didn't work. All the, the pipes used to sort of, uh, all the sort of suction on that pipe just collapsed the pipe. So I redesigned it and it did work in the end. So it's well worth having that at the refit stage. Look at these things. Have you got enough bilge pump power? Fit in the other one. It's lovely having all that safety on your boat when you're going across a big ocean. Gas. Obvious ones, store the gas well. 
Obviously have it in a locker where it's actually where the gas is leaking out of the boat rather than into the boat. When I left all those years ago, I took with me, I think, 12 different gas regulators. How many did I use? One. <laughs> the reality is, is there are two types of gas pretty well in the world now. There's the propane and the butane. In America, you're going to see propane. The only difference with the regulator is it's slightly different pressures, and you have to have a different regulator. And in fact, on Indaba, we've got the situation where we can switch from one to another purely on a, on a switch. And when you get to the American islands, you'll find there are different gas bottles. But as life has progressed, especially in the French islands, you'll find all the butane, no problem at all. But unfortunately, you will find occasionally you won't find the right gas. And in the Caribbean, it's very often you change cylinders here. You have to write your name in, of the boat on the give it to them and you get the same cylinder back. That often happens in the Caribbean. So mark all your bottles because they don't give you an exchange one. You have to use your own. The nav area. It is the most important place to me. I spent thousands and thousands of hours in this area. And when you're at Refit, this is your opportunity to get it how you want it. When I bought this boat, all the radios were behind in this area here. So obviously I moved them over to there. Much more user-friendly, that was the opportunity to get that bit right. That there is an SSB. It wasn't on the boat. And at the time, when I actually crossed a few times, this was a very good piece of kit to use to communicate. There was that wonderful chap called Herb, who used to give you weather forecasts backwards and forwards. I didn't actually join the net all the time, but I was there, and listening to it was wonderful. Getting all this talk it gave you a sense of community and feeling. And I'm not sure if the ARC still has... SSB radio communication. Do they still have SSB? Yeah, probably yes. so. It's a big part of the uh, cruise. The network, cruise. isn't it? Yes. And, uh, and there's, there's a wonderful prize, I think, called Voice of the Ark when you're on, on the Ark, of somebody who's on there holding nets and all the rest of it. And I used that throughout the Caribbean. When I was down in Venezuela, I was talking to mates up in Grenada and things like that. Proper bit of kit to communicate with. We used to have a net on a Tuesday and a Thursday. There's one guy who was very keen. He was like the net controller. So many people said to me, we had an SSB and it never worked. SSBs are pretty simple. If you've got the right aerial length, you've got a proper ATU, this is an ICOM 850, I think it's called. Brilliant bit of kit. I could speak to people right across the Atlantic and it was all to do with the installation and the refit. The man that fitted that was a chap here in Berthon, who's a great electronics man. He, sadly, he's retired now. But he fitted that for me and I never had a single bit of trouble from it. They do use quite a bit of power. But they're great bits of kit, and I would seriously consider, um, you know, when you install that, you have the correct person doing it at the refit stage so it works. AIS hadn't existed when I left for the Caribbean. I installed it when I was there. Marvellous. Absolutely marvellous. Two reasons. One, you can see the ship, and they can see you. But there's all this modern thing now with MOB, man overboard AIS. Now, some people dismiss it. I think it's great. We have them on our life jackets, and if... Unfortunately, Anne-Louise went over the side. I can see her there as an MOB. I can see on my main screen, which is by the wheel. And it's a little picture of a person in the water saying, help, help, rescue me. And what a wonderful thing to have, to actually be able to go to it. You won't be able to see that on an EPIRB. An EPIRB goes off on a signal to the satellite and it goes to the rescue station. It's not going to help you on the boat. But AIS, I love it. I installed that at the refit stage. You can see there my electrical box. Really old-fashioned, old poppers, old fuses. There's my Link 10 right there. I had a little holder there. When you're at sea, it gets rough. So I've got this belt that holds me in the seat. And I slightly redesigned this seat here to make it comfortable because you do spend an enormous amount of time there. And it's a very important area to look at for yourself personally. Are you comfortable with it there? Underneath there, you can't quite see it. That's my grab bag. It's actually a Pelican case, big one. And in there, I've got everything radios, batteries, torches, little medical kit. And I can throw that in the water and it floats. And it's solid. And I can get it, because when an emergency comes, I just grab that, rush out. It's not the best place to keep it, to be honest. If it was really rough and I was thinking about getting off, I might think about having that up on the deck. But these are the sort of areas that you need to look at for yourself personally. Do it at refit stage. When you're buying the boat, look at all these books I had. I was going to go off around the world and I didn't. But I had to buy a lot of pilots and everything else, and I found this area here to be good. I put this plank in, and that made a lovely library. So I could access all my navigational stuff right there. And that up there was one of the greatest designs, I think, that Carl Bayer ever did. It's a chart locker. So I didn't keep charts in there. I kept them up there. 
You've heard all this talk as well earlier on, keeping it simple. Why rely on all this electronics? I love my Simrad chop plot, it's wonderful. I have every chart that I needed though, pretty well. And that's where I kept them. On a small boat, it's quite difficult, this stowage thing. We were talking about overloading and all the rest of it, how much kit you've got on a boat. Put them in a, perhaps a round tube and stow them somewhere. If you're lucky enough to have a big boat, that was a wonderful place. I've got every chart that you could need in there. And I use them all the time. Lots of good charts. Admiralty. Uh, these ones here are mostly Imre for the Caribbean. Very user friendly. Um, look at that on the inventory and think about that in your refit. It is part of the refit, this. It's not just the boat. It's all the bits that are going to help you get there safely. Galley. You heard Alan saying it's wonderful with a central cockpit boat. You've got this area here that you walk down. That cooker we had was useless when we, when we bought the boat. And it can be a very expensive replacement. I bought a Plastimo 3000. That's it there. It's a wonderful cooker. It's got three burners. It's got a wonderful uh, grill and, a, and an oven. That's all we needed. And that is a vital area to look at when you're refitting. Pretty hot there. Ambient temperatures of 30 degrees to 40 degrees. And you can't really see it that well, but there's two little vents there that I dug into the cupboards. This is where the compressor is for the freezer here. And there's my top loading fridges on this side. And to get rid of the heat, I put in two little vents. So it vents out here, which made me put another hatch here, which goes into the cockpit. And I put a little fan under there. So when I'm cooking, or when anyone's cooking or whatever, I used to do a lot of the cooking myself. There's a vent going here for it, see? If we're at anchor, we've got these windows that open up, and I've got a hatch there, so all the ambient heat is driving away. Because it's a thing to think about when you're... You spend a lot of time cooking when you're at sea. You're making bread. You've got all these wonderful things that you're doing. And if you're in an area like that, you need to have thought about how this is all going to happen at the refit stage. There's a microwave. Great bit of kit to have on a boat. We can run that straight off the inverter. We don't have to start a, a generator or whatever. So that's why inverters are a good thing to think about. The back bed looks great, doesn't it? But we were talking about this. That's great in the harbour. As soon as you go to sea, you fall out there, you fall up there. Two people in that would be the nightmare at sea. So what we do, we've converted this. It's actually a split mattress. And there's a leak off that goes between the two. And it's actually very comfortable. I tend not to sleep there, to be honest. When I'm at watch, there's only two of us. I'm near the nav area. There's a lovely berth there that I can sleep in. But Anne Louise, she loves to go to bed and have a good night's sleep. And there's two things you can't quite see. There's a couple of fans. Fans are vital on a boat if you're not having air conditioning. Move the air. I've got all these wonderful portholes in the boat which help enormously, hatches, and I even have one of those chutes, you can buy these vent, vent chutes that go through, drives the air through the boat. We found we didn't, for the most part, need any air <coughs> conditioning. So that's that, engine generator, batteries, fuel, diesel heaters, make sure they keep being used, fire extinguishers, the list. On deck, I'm going to rush through this because this is something we'll cover perhaps in, in another one. Obviously look at all your various bits and pieces, make sure they're all in good condition. Hatches, my hatches leaked madly, I had to replace all the rubbers all around them. Make sure those are done at the refit stage rather than finding that out on your first trip. Winches, that's a marvellous cowl that. When you're going up wind in tropical conditions, the only way to keep a boat cool if you've got no air conditioning is to have good ones of these. The ones I had originally, as soon as the wave came into them, that filled the cabin up with water. Hopeless. This is a great one. Big box, so look at your air venting if you're going to have to go up wind in the Caribbean. We already touched on this windlass. This is the most important part of the boat because you are using it so much. And I was lucky enough to have a hydraulic one which is very powerful. But, yet again, I made a mistake. Chain. First of all, many boats I saw in the Caribbean had an anchor that was well below what it should have been. There's plenty of information in books for the right size of anchor. I've got an anchor that's 85 pounds. I could probably get away with 75. The bigger you've got, the better. There are moorings in the Caribbean. There are moorings, for instance, in places like the BVI, which are regulated and you have to use. But there are many places further down in the Grenadines where they'll offer you a mooring. If you go on it and there's a wind, there's every chance it'll break and you'll fall off it. Rely on your own gear. Good gear. I left here and the mistake I made was I looked at the chain and I thought, that's good enough. It was a 10 mil chain, and it really wasn't heavy enough for the yacht. The yacht was nearly 30 tons, so I should have upgraded to a heavier chain. Not only that, it was in very bad condition, so very quickly I changed it. What I had was 50 meters of chain on that. Is that enough? 
No. 50 meters really wasn't enough. So I went to Guadeloupe and I found some really nice cheap chain. It was very cheap and I bought 110 meters of it off this fantastic Frenchman. I changed it within a year. <laughs> it was rusty, horrible, wasn't rated. And I finally did the real thing and I upgraded the whole thing to a 12 mil and it's what they call BBB, the rated chain. The breaking strain of a proper rated chain is in fact a lot, lot more than the French one I bought that was cheap. And that gave me great confidence. And so look at your chain at the refit stage when you're starting to do this. I now have 160 meters of chain and it's just enough. People will tell you, go three times the depth or whatever. I don't believe in that. Five times the depth minimum. And if you've got a lot of chain, why have it on the boat? Have it out there. Because if the wind gets up in the night, the last thing you want to do is end up on the reef. And the trouble with that is that you're putting a lot of weight. We were talking about weight, trying to keep the weight out the ends. Well, I'm afraid I just overrode that. I thought I want a lot of chain because if, particularly if you go off to the Pacific regions, you're going to be anchoring in really deep water sometimes. And putting rope on the end isn't always satisfactory with all this coral head worry and everything. So if you can get 200 meters of chain on your boat, put it on. It's great to have. And if you get into a really bad gale, you can put out all this stuff and it'll save your boat. Putting a piece of rope on the end isn't ideal, and um, I love having all that chain up there. It, does, it doesn't alter the pitch of the boat at all, because it's a big yacht. But if you're on a smaller boat, obviously that's not practical. But put as much as you can, heavy as you can, to fit your windlass. Dinghy we touched on. Brilliant to have a dinghy, and they're absolutely right. This is your motor car. I was lucky enough to be able to upgrade my dinghy to one a bit like this. And Louise loved wakeboarding, so we went to a 40 horsepower, would you believe? And we had, this is not mine, uh, this is off a, 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 an oyster or something. They put it up there and it's your car. That was my first dinghy. We had the decision of whether I have a 6, a 10 or a 15. I'm very pleased to say we went to a 15 horsepower. It was an Avon Rover, solid bottom, so you can go up onto the sort of shingly type places. You need a good lock. This is the one that you have in your refit. Make sure you've got a lock that's really good because they get stolen everywhere. And I could lock my fuel tank on that same system so that nothing could get stolen. Um, it's a wonderful thing. You'll notice it's got what we call chaps on it. Your enemy is the sun. If you're going to be any length of time in tropical sun, you get degradation on the rubber and you will see a lot of dinghies out in the Caribbean with chaps. And uh, it protects the boat often against horrible docks and everything. When I sold that dinghy, I took the chaps off. It looked like a new boat. It really did. And so it's a good thing to have. Alternative sources of power, at refit you've got to consider this. I didn't, I had two engines, two generators, I felt that was enough, a big boat, and it worked all right for me. I never got to the stage when everything was down. But these are great, they don't work surprisingly that well when you're sailing along. But when you're in the Caribbean and trade winds at anchor, they work wonderfully if you can put up with the noise. Going along, these Dewar gens have got great popularity now, great bit of kit, and there's a new one that's come out called a Watton Sea. You'll see these on a lot, lots of racing boats. There was one on a Norma 60 trimaran that I race on. Fantastic bit of kit. Goes down in the water, terrific amount of, um, we were getting like 15 amps off this. Wonderful piece of kit. Um, and nowadays, solar panels, they are absolutely terrific. They're starting to get very, very sophisticated as technology's moved on. Think about having uh, some solar panels at refit stage. Retrofitting all this stuff doesn't work often. A lot of people go off thinking, well, maybe we'll fit that. I did a bit of that. It does work, but if you can do it at the beginning, you'll save yourself a heartache. Do you remember Jeremy was talking about that wonderful situation with the American? He was sitting there having fun, going to all the parties, because he was ready. And if you have the time, and you can afford to get it ready before, spend that time. Don't forget, it took me 18 months before I felt I was ready. And that was barely enough time. Sun's your enemy. Canvas, we're not that good in Europe at canvas sometimes, uh, but nowadays people have really got used to this. And there's some great canvas people in the UK. And you can see here, you do need a good bimini when you're out in that tropical sun. This is a clever one. You see this piece here, that it's attached between there and the actual uh, dodger. That's great if a squall comes through, because you do get terribly wet. And in fact, on Indaba, we've got a piece that drops down there, because if the wind's behind you and a gale and a squall comes from behind, just goes horizontally into the cockpit. So think about your canvas. There's a nice piece to keep you cool. All your sails and things like that, this is something to really think about. We're not so conscious of this perhaps in the UK or Northern waters. The UV is a big enemy out there. And I eventually did the whole thing. 
This was a marvellous bit of kit. You'll see there in Venezuela, it was the one place where it was so hot and arid, I actually put a little air conditioning unit, just a, a normal de domestic one, that sat over a hatch, and you can't quite see the pipe, but it dripped the water over the side. As soon as I put that on top, the interior temperature of the boat dropped by about five degrees. Marvellous bit of kit. We call it a tout soleil. This can be an awful pain if it takes you an hour to put up. This was designed with a little slide there, so it slides in like a sail onto the boom. I can put that whole thing up in about 10 to 12 minutes. Keep it simple. It's no point in having that if it's going to take you an hour to put up, because you just don't use it. But we used to pop it up as soon as we got to Anchorage. A whole, it's funny that the air seems to come through the yacht and through, and it sort of keeps that wonderful coolness on deck, and it completely transformed the inside of the yacht by quite a, a marked amount, as I can tell you. So think about your refit. Are you going to put lots of canvas on? I wish I'd done that from the beginning. Life raft, not going to stop there. The apocryphal story of the poor chap who ended up in, in the start of the ark and his life raft didn't actually qualify. And that's the time to do it. When I bought the boat, there was a wonderful auto fluke. I thought it was going to be my pride and joy. And in fact, it was condemned by ocean safety. £2,000 straight on the bottom line. Really hard. And I thought it was not the thing I'd have to spend the money on. Don't skimp on that. Get the surveyor, get them to look at it, to have a good life on. Electricity. Uh, when you get to the Caribbean, you may want to go alongside the docks. Bear in mind that electricity can be a real problem. You'll get 240, 250 volts, but quite often it's 60 cycles rather than 50. If you put your microwave on that, very quickly it'll blow it up. My battery chargers, fortunately, can hand 50 cycles or 60 cycles. And, in fact, my generator, I can alter that to put different things in. You can buy a very smart, fancy piece of kit, which basically takes in almost anything and gives your boat what you want. That is a wonderful solution. It's getting cheaper. I saw one the other day for about £1,000. And they were more like £12,000 at one stage. But bear in mind that there are different plugs. I managed to accumulate about 25 different <laughs> plug things. More and more standardisation is coming in. There's a lot of this European stuff. If you go anywhere in the French islands in the Guadeloupe, like places like that, St. Martin, they've got these standard plugs. Look at the ones on the deck. My one actually goes into a locker that's slightly inside the cockpit. But many boats have this ring main that starts from a piece like this. That's vitally important. You have a proper electrician. Look at all this. This is potential fire. The reason is that when I was in Cuba, I measured it up once, and there's 390 volts coming in on the boat. And that's why it was all tripping. So you need to have a tester. Make sure your ring mains up to withstanding uh, a surge and a spike. And it can upset all your electronics and things like that if you don't look after it. There I am bowling down the thing. I'm not going to stop on that too long. But sails, have your sails looked at. People will tell you that you're going off to the big blue and there's hundreds of waves of wind. I spent hours and hours sailing along mid-Atlantic like this. It's amazing. You're miles from anywhere and it's like flatter than the Solent. Hard to believe. And... Good sails, terribly important to get you along nicely, comfortable. And that's how a boat crosses the Atlantic invariably. So that's all the stuff on deck. Sails, covers, everything else. You can add to that. Spare parts, so important. It, perhaps less than it was. When I first went to the Caribbean in 1970, you could hardly get anything. Nowadays, you've got these wonderful marine places like Budget, Island Water World. They stock pretty well most of the stuff. A lot of it's American standard. Bear in mind if your boat's 24 volt, or if it's in fact 12 volt. When I left, I had G4 lighting in all the various places. I've got about, I think, 30 lights in the boat. I took hundreds and hundreds of spare G4s. It's not a very green bulb. You can't buy them easily even today. How many do you think I changed in 15 years? Well, they came in boxes of 10, and I'm still on the first box. They're amazing. They don't break for some reason. And... Uh, in fact, nowadays you can get these wonderful ones that fit the same fitting, which they're quite expensive, but they're LED, they hardly use any power. Go LED where you can. And as Jeremy said, I went retro on my wonderful, uh, I've got two navigation lights and I put in one of the new LED things. It blew up almost immediately, which was very upsetting because they're about 60 quid each. And so it, I've got one in the top, but to put them down low where the water gets to them and they're not sealed, they're not very water friendly. You have to have the right fittings for them to work. And I've got one as a stern light, and I use my tricolour, which is a single LED right up the top for, for, for power saving. Because even on a big boat like mine, where I've got lots of power, you go off expecting the worst. You try and keep your power under consideration. 
Who knows what you'll need? Have you got enough? Have you got too much? You'll always end up with too much on a boat, as has been said already. Uh, and Anne Louise was wonderful on this. She did spreadsheets. I used to go into the swindlery. That's what I call it, not the chandlery. And there's all these wonderful shiny things. And oh, we need one of those, we need one of those. And she would have the list. No, nope, you've got two of those already. No, we haven't. Yes, we have. So I ended up buying all sorts of stuff we didn't need originally. Because we had it in stores already. So keep a check on it. One, just a spreadsheet. And as you use one, put one back. Things like water pumps. We've got two types of pumps, one for the macerator and one for the water. We always have one of each new on board. And we have changed quite a few of those because they do wear out. Particularly if a pipe falls off and it runs for two days, you're going to need to change it. I'm back with my hat on. We back up our customers when they travel overseas. Remember, you're never that far away from a DHL office. That's not an ideal situation, really. You want to be ready to go. You don't want to be us sending your stuff out there. So do your refit well. Keep a sensible amount of spare parts, and you need to keep a log. And this is what my wonderful wife is so good at. She kept a marvellous inventory and budget. I was dying to dive in on the budget one, because we even set a clothing budget. And Anne Louise spent a whole year on one pair of shorts and some barts. So we had to up her budget, I'm afraid. <laughs> Bag up your bits, put a label on it, keep it there. That's where you're going. Refit with Burton or somebody decent, and that's where you'll end up and have a wonderful time. Have great fun. That's all I'm going to bore you with tonight.